Hey there! We just wanted to take a moment to thank each and every one of you who have listened, shared, engaged, and sent us love. It means the world to know that we've had the chance to spread even just a little bit of knowledge, insight, and encouragement to you along your health journeys. If you'd like to support the work we're doing, we've created a Patreon page where you can earn some exciting rewards, because being a part of the HIP team isn't just a hobby, it's a lifestyle. Contributions start as low as $1 a month, with each level offering a number of super fun perks, like monthly bonus episodes, Q&As, a portrait drawn by our own in-house artists, and even personal chats with the Health It's Personal team. We created this podcast so that everyone can have the chance to access informative, inspirational, and insightful stories. And your support is a huge step in us reaching those who need it most. We wish we could give you all a big hug, but hopefully this will suffice, at least until we're allowed to hug again. If you love what you hear or are as passionate about health as we are, please visit patreon.com slash the hip podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash the HIP podcast. We couldn't do this without you. So thank you again. And thanks in advance for joining our ever growing hip family. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Health It's Personal. We kicked off our parenting series last week with Dr. Becky Kennedy, who shared her expertise on starting conversations that we don't always know how to begin. And today we are thrilled to share an inspiring talk with the delightful Michael Tyler. He has authored many wonderful stories, including his hit children's book, The Skin You Live In, which concepts stem from the early conversations he had to have with his young son about race. Yeah, McKenna and I met Michael 15 years ago at the Children's Museum in Chicago. That's awesome. Yeah, and he made an impression on us, as did his book. He's such a light and an inspiring person, and getting to talk with him again on a deeper level has been a dream for us. He really got us thinking more deeply about all kinds of topics. And after, I was thinking more about the role I played um, with this topic in regards to my community and my society as a whole, and also my parenting. Often being white means that you don't have to think about what it means to be white, right? Right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And as a father, Michael had to think about how he would talk to his son about race when his son came home from school asking questions. Yeah, I'm sure he had been anticipating this moment, but hoped it wouldn't come when his son was only five. You know, that feels like a tough conversation to have. And, you know, we refer to these topics that we talk about on the podcast as tough conversations, but it doesn't have to be a tough (laughs) conversation. It's (laughs) It's a conversation that we all need to be having and that can be really insightful and reflective and inspiring, but that just unfortunately has caused a lot of serious problems in our world hurt and pain Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. but michael does such a great way of helping people talk about it and revisit it in such a positive way for sure and it's something that's so far down generationally that it's not something that we can just wave away or wish away so it's definitely something we have to actively work through and they are tough conversations right now but we we hope that they won't be down the road. Maybe we can get past that, you know, tough conversations um, and just have conversations. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a great point, Sean, because I falsely thought that my heart and mind, if they were set right, that I didn't need to take action every single day to make an mm-hmm. impact beyond me and the lives I personally touch, which was ignorant. And it makes an impact on how quickly things can move forward. The only way for us to go beyond is to make conscious steps and choices yeah right every day and unless it's directly affecting us then we don't Mm -hmm. which is nuts because it's directly affecting all of us absolutely it is that's something i hope that we can all continue to work on you know caring about things even if it doesn't directly impact us we should still care about it even if you know it's not our friend or our family member or ourselves A thousand percent. Yeah, yeah. So he got us thinking about what families can do to help kids understand the beauty in our differences and that it's not enough to say nothing to Mm -hmm. our kids and hope they won't say something or do something that isn't kind or life altering. Yeah, growing up, we didn't have too many conversations about it, but we had such a diverse group of friends. Both my parents had so many diverse people in their lives. Uh, Growing up in the military, we, you know, served with so many diverse families and it was just never a thing and we didn't realize I'm sure my parents didn't realize we need to have these conversations because for us it wasn't a thing and that's great but at the same time like we just talked about 
we have to have these conversations, even if everything is great in our personal lives. Because even if in your community, it seemed like that was the normal in a lot of other communities, it wasn't. But how great that you had that experience, Sean. Yeah, it's a good thing for sure. (laughs) Yeah, so Michael challenges us to think beyond ourselves. And he didn't just provide us with this beautiful book, but so much more. And it's important to put this book into our library and talk with our kids often about Mm -hmm. how they're beautiful and unique, but also show them what is beautiful and unique about others. I love that. He talks a bit about tolerance and how that Mm. word isn't helpful Mm -hmm. at all and about acceptance. But I think appreciation is where we should be aiming. Or embracing. (laughs) Yeah. Excitement. <laughs> <laughs> whoop, whoop. Yeah. En- enlightenment. Enlightenment. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, you know, we have a lot of conversations about health on this podcast, and this affects all of our lives and our, our wellness and our well being and our mental health and our emotional health and our emotional security. And, and this is something that our health stems from. And, having those conversations is just the beginning of a healthy, well-rounded life. Absolutely. exactly. It's important to make an effort to seeing and surrounding ourselves with all types of beauty. And so that our kids will want to do the same. Yeah. And we can, you know, use books like The Skin You Live In to spark those conversations. I know we've all been talking about Toni Morrison and how inspirational her books have been for us and for some of our other guests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael Miller, the student success coach we spoke with in our very first episode, discussed how he uses narrative and storytelling to practice empathy and expand his emotional intelligence. And when we speak of this, he too brought up Toni Morrison uh, because as we've mentioned, as a privileged white person, you have to go out of your way oftentimes to fully understand what all people are experiencing because we don't necessarily face that adversity every day. And storytelling is such an excellent way to feel those emotions and make those connections. And knowing how powerful language and image are, especially for a young child, Michael Tyler used this method to help families like ours have those conversations in our home. So a huge thank you to him for continuing this journey of education. Oh my gosh. And Michael Miller constantly comes up in this podcast. Yeah. I know. <laughs> just just Michael things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Michaelisms. <laughs> yeah, so I was it got me really thinking and about how we use so many things in our lives to help educate ourselves, such as films, TV shows, books. And I was so inspired by that again. Um, you know, while we can't just pick up any film or TV show or book and expect that to teach us everything, or for that to even be the perfect representation, because so many people out there are misrepresenting things too. So we have to be aware. But I use lots of films, books, television shows, and commercials and things like that to help teach my own students in my humanities courses, film courses, and pop culture to kind of expand their own understanding by putting themselves in the shoes of others and experiencing things from their perspective, if for only two hours. And it makes a huge difference, I feel like. We'll never fully understand what that person is going through, whether it's about race or gender or sexuality or socioeconomics, but we can at least get an idea to help build our empathy and expand on our own humanity. Yeah. It's a privilege to be able to sit down at the end of an evening and watch TV and and kind of relax and reboot, uh, especially now since our days are, have been full of so much emotion and stress, but making conscious decisions to expand our palate. Absolutely. Michael turned a painful situation into purpose by writing a book he shouldn't have had to write mm. <laughs> in order to educate those that impact the people he loves. And it's a tool, not a solution. It's a beautiful contribution, but reading it to our kids is just one of many actions we need to take daily to make an impact. For sure. Racism and anti-racism is not about how we feel or who we are, but what we do. And I think that's important to remember. Yeah, always. Because I haven't always remembered that. 
Yeah, so this is just such a great example of someone who's really spent a lot of time thinking about how to have these tough conversations and I think provides some really inspiring insights on how to do that in your own families. And after just a few minutes with him, he already felt like our family. Yes, make those connections. You know, I just grab random people out of the world that I meet and make them my family and he's he's definitely one. Yeah. And yeah, before we wrap it up, we just want to say thank you to our patrons this week. Yeah, Robbie Pyers and Krista Lewis. You guys are so amazing. Thank you for all the support. We really appreciate you. So please, everyone, grab a cup of tea and enjoy this conversation with Michael Tyler. Health is understanding what you need. Being informed. Finding that balance of mental and physical. Building yourself a support system. Figuring things out on my own and not letting it hold me back. You do kind of have to advocate for yourself. Because health, it's personal. Last week, we talked with Dr. Becky Kennedy about tough conversations. Your book, The Skin You Live In, was conceived after you found yourself having a tough conversation with your young son. Would you mind telling us about that situation and what led you to writing this book? Uh, Absolutely. It it all began on a playground that my uh, school that my son went to to school at. Both my sons are mixed race. There's a politicization of identities that goes on with race. And even people who are mixed race are not protected from that politicization. And so it was the first time at age five, when he was on that playground and was being taunted for his appearance, that he had to deal with racially disparaging terms. Right. And when he came home that day, he was traumatized. Now, a lot of the what he was being called, the name calling, he didn't really understand. It was the first time he had heard such words. The tone. But they were hurtful nonetheless because 80% of our communication is done non-verbally. Mm-hmm. And so the facial expressions, the tones, the body positions, the postures, the gestures that people, his, his peers were using while they were taunting him, he clearly understood that they were not affirming him. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know those words, but I, I know what you mean. <laughs> exactly right. And so when he came home and brought this story to me. Uh, of course, I was pained by it, as any parent would be. But I also realized that he had come of age, even though it was a young, tender, innocent age, as I perceived it to be, in which society was already being visited upon him. And I had to address the situation. And a point of note I would, would make about this before I go on with the story is a lot of times parents have asked me, when do you have conversations like this with your children? Mm-hmm. And I would pass along a bit of advice that my mother gave me right before I became a father for the first time. And she said that whenever a child asks you a question or makes a statement to you because they need understanding, they're ready to understand it. Oh, that's good. It's not for you to dismiss it because you're not comfortable with it. You have to find a way to have that conversation with them because their perception of it already exist yeah and for you to dismiss it only connotes to them that it's problematic and that it's negative and that's not the interpretation you want them to have you want them to have some kind of understanding of what it is they're seeking an understanding of so with that in mind i said to myself i have to give my son some understanding of what racism is yeah and at five that was incredibly daunting for, for me as an adult to talk to a five-year-old child because Adults can't have this conversation right. with, with one another. If we could, my five-year-old child would not have had that problem. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I came to a perplexing moment, and, and I say this to all parents out there with empathy and sympathy, when you realize that your parental omnipotence is a lie. Oh, <laughs> my gosh, right? <laughs> so challenging. We, we like to present to our children that we have all the answers they need to yeah. know. Right. They like to believe that we do. And that's our false blanket of security that we want to wrap them in. And part of that is for our own peace of mind. Yeah. But some situations like this one come about and you realize that the fallacy is there and you got to deal with that fallacy as well as resolving the issue, the crisis at the moment for your child. So I, I took the method that many parents take, I, I call the parental cop out. <laughs> I said to my son, I'm going to go get a book and I'll read that book to you. And then you'll have a better understanding of what this is all about. And all I was looking for primarily was a book that would allow me to have a conversation starting point. 
Yes. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to find the right words. Yeah. Very, very hard to find the right words. And so I figured this was going to be a really easy task, that there had to be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of titles written out there about the subject that would allow me to do something. And when I started reading books, and I read 347 books in two weeks, <laughs> I realized there was nothing out there that I wanted to impart to my son to resolve this issue and to give him a foundational understanding about how to go forward. Right. And a couple of reasons why. One was because many of these books, the overall subject is tolerance. Right. They fall under a few categories. One is many of them are parental guides. They're written for adults and how to raise a more tolerant child. Which like turns your stomach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 how about it? If that doesn't turn your stomach, this, this certainly will. And, and as I researched those books, I came to realize that when you look at the overall sales of those books, that they represented less than 1% of the total adult population. So that's just how unsuccessful those books were at reaching an adult audience that was actually interested yeah. in pursuing this with their own children. Okay, less than 1% of the total adult population. The other thing that I realized is that a, a lot of these books try to approach this subject conceptually. They will use animals and they'll use inanimate objects to try to tell a story about what it means to have tolerance. And, and I bring up one book, and I don't mean to disparage this book by bringing it up by title, because it's been a very successful book. But there's a book called The Crayon Box. It's, it's a box of crayons, and, and they're all having a, a debate about who's the best crayon. And, Little girl comes by and draws a beautiful picture, and they realize that they each one of them has a beauty to contribute in terms of their own color. Yeah. Now for the adult teacher, and that's a beautiful message. So it abstract. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but for for the adults, the teachers and the parents and the grandparents and grandfathers and so on out there, they feel good about giving that message to a child. But for a child, talking box of crayons. That's all. <laughs> yep. That's all it really is. <laughs> <laughs> they have teddy bears to talk to them. They have toothbrushes to talk to them. They have Kool-Aid pictures to talk to them. And, and their mind for a child who's less than seven years old, less than eight years old, they don't have that abstraction. Their, their thought process is far more literal. So I knew that that type of book was not going to service the aim that I had. Can you imagine if you were like, listen, buddy, um, so there was this box of crayons. <laughs> 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 it's almost like a punchline. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and with my son, he would have, he would have wondered why Violet was named Violet. So I'm, I'm already <laughs> lost on that one. <laughs> the, the wrong, the wrong focus. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the other paradigm that I observed when I read all of those books was that a character was often introduced into a community. And a character who was introduced was very unusual or something about them was different. And they were immediately alienated and disparaged because they were different. Until the community that was disparaging and alienating them found that this odd character had a talent or a skill that actually benefited them. And then they embraced them. The, the, the tale of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is a classic. <laughs> Karen's favorite. I know. We, <laughs> we've chatted about this. It makes me crazy. Yeah, it makes me crazy, too. There's a, there's a book named Odd Velvet. I use the word odd. It has a similar tale to it, a similar story to it. And I didn't want to read any book like that to my child because I didn't want him growing up. His, his existence is already politicized, basically. I didn't want him growing up thinking that, and I don't think any parent or any adult should want a child growing up thinking that their value as an individual is predicated upon their utility to a group right. that would otherwise ostracize them. And so, yeah, I, I, there, there's, there's no moral leap of virtue there as far as I'm concerned in teaching that lesson, which, which brings me to the point of why the lesson of tolerance is also problematic. We talk about tolerance as if it's a moral virtue, and it's not, it's not at all. Tolerance simply means to endure something. It doesn't mean to embrace something. It doesn't mean to welcome something, just simply endure. When I walk through shopping malls and people look past me or look through me or walk by me suspiciously or clutch their purses, they're only tolerating my presence. They're not embracing or affirming my existence as they would themselves as someone who looks like them. And so I didn't want to teach tolerance to my child. 
Now, as a writer, I began studying words and etymology of words and meanings of words when I was eight years old, really got into them. I knew that there was a word out there that I really wanted to drive home to my son that was totally different than tolerance. To me, it was a, a much higher level that we should aim for, and that's acceptance. Mm. And people oftentimes think that tolerance and acceptance mean the same thing. They don't mean the same thing at all. You can yeah. tolerate a foul odor walking down the street, but you don't want to accept that as the only odor you smell all day long, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> These, these words do not mean the same thing at all. <laughs> or like just just right now with the co- coronavirus situation, we can tolerate it. We have to tolerate it. We have to endure it. But I'm not going to necessarily accept it, you know, as, yeah, we don't oh, I love it. don't want to be our permanent <laughs> existence, right? Yeah. And that's why I push for the cure. And and I, I thought that this is the word I wanted to teach my son, but I had to break it down for him to understand it. So I broke top acceptance down into three components. The first component is recognition. Okay, so when we walk down the street and we see people, many times we don't give people eye contact, we don't acknowledge their presence or anything. And so we immediately devalue the presence of everyone on the sidewalk by not even acknowledging that they exist, by not even recognizing that someone's in front of us or it's just walk past us. So that was the first thing was recognition. The other was actually acknowledge their existence. That means making the eye contact. Okay, that, that means actually looking at someone. And through that acknowledgement, we have to affirm that we both have a common humanity. Absolutely. And that's a thought process. That's not something you necessarily have to project verbally. But as I said, we speak more non-verbally than we do verbally. Facial expression lets me know whether or not you are accepting my common humanity, just by the way you look at me. Uh, a, a classic childhood anecdote I have with respect to that, which led me to think of this, was when I was younger, I used to listen to the the colloquialisms and idioms and slangs of the people around me uh, in the 1960s, 1970s. And one of the words that they often used was connect, making connections. And I grew up in an era where there were retractable cores of vacuum cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> I must have broken up 12 of them, just banging on the cord all the time. And, and I had a neighbor who was fond of throwing outdoor parties on his, his patio. And so he wanted to have outdoor lighting and he created this whole elaborate lighting system for his patio. And the outlets that he, uh, part of the system had flip cover lids on them to protect it from the rain. Oh yeah. And I put my hand underneath the gate and play with it all the time because I like the noise of it. <laughs> now, I put those two things together. I put the flip cover lids and the outlets and the retractable cords together. And I came up with this game, I was five years old. I made up this game where I would split my body in half visually. And on one side, I would put the outlets with the flip cover lids. And on the other side, I would put retractable cords with the plugs. And I would walk down the street whenever I was out with my mother or anytime I was out in public. And I would look at who was, who was approaching. And I would visualize them being similarly constructed, half their bodies, flip cover lids and outlets, the other half, retractable cords and plugs. And I would try to make eye, eye contact with somebody. And that was me extending my plug towards them. Okay. If, they, if they looked at me and smiled, then that meant that they were taking the cover off their outlet and allowing me to connect with them, huh. making a connection. <laughs> and so I would count how many connections I would make every time I would go out. Oh, that's really elaborate thinking for a five-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I spent a lot of my teenage years by myself and thinking like that. But I, <laughs> I was like, I don't know how to have a conversation with this guy. So, <laughs> so, so I, I would count how many connections I would make, and I would be happy if the number was really high. But I noticed as I got older that those not that number of connections grew smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Because as I aged, I became more threatening to society. When I was a child, I wasn't as threatening. But I was still the same individual. I still had the same mentality. I still had the same perspectives. But how I was perceived was different. But it was from that game that I played that I came to understand that acceptance needed to be broken down with recognition, acknowledgement, and affirmation. And so having not been able to find a book that dealt with that, I decided that I'm a writer. I have to write it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do it myself <laughs> if you want it done right. <laughs> I have to do it myself. This is a parental dilemma. And so, 
And so I, I spent about two weeks, two additional weeks. This is beyond the two weeks of trying to read books. At this point in time, my son is growing very disgruntled with me by not having this conversation with him because he's still dealing with name calling. And I spent two weeks thinking about what it is I was going to write because this is very difficult to word it in such a way that he actually understands. And so I started thinking about it in terms of how do you write a book for a child that age? And the vocabulary range is, you know, two, three thousand, four thousand words. And I knew immediately that I wanted to make a poem of it. I wanted it to rhyme because I wanted him to be able to commit it to memory. Yeah. Just like you easily commit nursery rhymes to memory, I figured that this would be the way to go. I wanted it to use a rhyme pattern like, like Dr. Seuss in order for it to be more melodic, to have a kind of a catchy meter to it. But as I was contemplating it, I also started to think that children's books are read by adults. Mm -hmm. Yep. I wanted to write in such a way that the adult readers would begin to take an audit of themselves and their indoctrinations and their thought processes and what they were putting into the minds of children. So there was a duality of purpose I had. I wanted to resolve something for my son, but as doing it as a book, I also wanted to be able to challenge adults about their thinking on this issue. I think you just mm. solved all problems. <laughs> Turn it into a children's okay. book so that adults have to read it over and over <laughs> and over. I only hope that more adults will read it over and over and over again. And, and so I, I ended up writing the skin you live in. Now, listen to that title and go back to what I said a few moments ago, that a child that young has an understanding that's more literal than it is abstract, than it is conceptual. And I knew that I had to go directly to the literal problem of what racism was, the colorization of our skin and, and what we lay on to that. And so I knew I wanted to write something about the skin. And I came up with the title, The Skin You Live In, because I was talking to my son, you. And that's, that's how I eventually came up with the book, The Skin You Live In, and took it from there. Um, I actually met you, Michael. I'm sure you remember me. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. 2005. Yeah, McKenna and I actually met Michael in 2005 at the um, Chicago Children's Museum. And I, as a parent, was always looking for ways or resources that my child would never make another person feel the way in which your child had to feel. And I knew right away when I saw your book that that needed to be part of our story, our library experience. Yeah, absolutely. And so it was so lovely meeting you then. I just, I, I thought the book was brilliant. And I loved how it included every single color of skin it felt all inclusive for every single person, no matter what color your skin was. And so really flattered to hear you say that. And I'm also appreciative that my book was introduced into a home environment in which that messaging was already being delivered. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that more home environments exist like that or are being created like that. You brought up how I dealt with color in the book. And that was a very touchy subject. How do you deal with color with children? Because the terms black and white are political terms. No matter where you go in the world, those words when used to describe people speak to a racial hierarchy, no matter where you go in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we use those terms with children, all we are doing is reinforcing that racialization of who they are. Because so many people don't fit into either one of those categories. Exactly. Not only that, there's no such thing really as a black or a white person. When you look at melanin content, there's no such thing. There's not even a such thing as a geographical reference to it. There's only one country I can think of that has a, a, a color word in its name. That's Greenland. It's the only one. There's no black man out there, white man out there. It's Greenland. Right. And so there's no validity to the construct of those words anyway. They are political constructs. And I wanted to move away from dealing with that. And part of how I came to that section of the book, uh, there, there are two stories associated with that. One was when my son was three years old, because he's a little bit lighter complected than I am, and he wanted to be like his dad. I'm very humble by that, but he wanted to be <laughs> like his dad. He, was, he came to me one day, he was in tears, and he was wondering when he was going to become the same color that I was. Why was he lighter than I was? He wanted to be Aww. dark brown like me. 
And I was distressed by that. And, and here's an example of what I mean by to parents. When a child brings you an issue, you got to figure out a way to deal with it. So here I am, here I am with a three-year-old. I, I guess that was me in training for the five-year-old incident that came mm -hmm. later. But here I am dealing with a three-year-old who's already having an issue with his own Yes, color. I wish you would have written the book Brown Like Me. Uh, I bought it. But, but it came to this. This is what happened from that. Because I realized I had to deal with that situation in that moment. So I'm, I'm a person who's fond of being in the kitchen. So I took him into the kitchen. And I said to him, I'm going to make you a cup of cappuccino. And I want you to pretend that this cup of cappuccino is you. And I'm going to bring out the ingredients for you to look at. Okay, so the brown coffee and the brown cinnamon will be me. And the white milk and the white sugar will be your mother. And when we mix it together, we're going to create you. And so I took him through this whole process of how you make cappuccino. And when it came time for him to pour the milk into the coffee, I said to him, I want you to pour it in and stir it. Do it slowly now, because you have to make sure that the color of the coffee is exactly the same color as your skin. Because we're making you in that cup right there. Okay? And so he took his time and he did it. And then I said, okay, now we got to add the sweetness to it because you're a sweet child. No. <laughs> Sugar and stirred it up, put some foam on top, sprinkled some cinnamon on top. And I said, and now I want you to taste you and I want you to tell me what you think. Okay, because now this cup, he understands this cup represents him. So he takes a sip and he looks at me. He's got a white mustache or froth all across his face. <laughs> and he smiles and he says, I taste good. <laughs> That's really cool. Oh my gosh, world's best dad. From that point on, for like two years, he kept calling himself the Cappuccino Bambino. Everybody <laughs> referred to him as the Cappuccino Bambino. But that was an example of what I meant by. When a child brings you a situation, you got to deal with it right then. Because of that, when it came time for me to write the book, that I understood that I had to treat this color section very differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this was the biggest hang up that I had in trying to write the book. Because I understood how to deconstruct the mythology about racism. I didn't have a problem with that. But it was a color thing that was really challenging. And it all came to head for me when my wife sent me to the body shop to buy her cosmetics. Okay. <laughs> now, for any man who's ever had to go through this, this is not a situation that you relish. It's actually like a punishment. <laughs> I didn't know anything about cosmetics. I, I was terrified. Even though I had a list, I was terrified getting the wrong thing. Right. Okay? And so I walked into the store, and I was the only man in the store. One of the women who worked there approached me, and she said, you look like you have a lot of problems. Give me that list. I'll, I'll take care of this for you. I said, thank you. <laughs> she knew. I wanted to buy a Christmas gift. She said, thank you. <laughs> and so while she was getting all the products, I was looking at the lotions and I was looking at the creams and I was looking at the perfumes. And I realized that a lot of the products in the store had food names associated with it, like mango and avocado and coffee and strawberry and all this kind of thing. At the same time, I knew before I walked into that store, I was armed with one particular fact as I was researching books, children's books in particular, that 80% of all children's books are bought by women. That makes sense, yeah. How, yeah. how did those two facts come together with me? How did my experience in the store and that fact come together for me? It came together because I realized that women didn't have a problem with food term associations with products that they were using on their own skin. Right, yeah. yeah. Saying women were also buying books for children. So somehow I could make a model out of this. All I had to do was look at what foods existed that had similar skin tone colors. And I started writing a list of foods that I thought I could use to describe skin tones. And that was exactly how I came up with that section of the book. I thought it would be a much greater frame of reference and more universal for children all over the world to have these food associations, right. this positive, taste good, feel good association with skin tones, then the political turns black and white. And that's how I came up with that section of the book. I love it. It's so brilliant. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's really cool. And you can find inspiration anywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Can you believe that? I know you're just out shopping and you're like, okay, done. Absolutely. I was happy about that. <laughs> yeah. I no longer saw it as a punishment. <laughs> So when we met at the museum, you had actually told me another story about persistence that really stuck out to me. And I actually shared it in a recent episode with Gabriella Day. 
and it was about how your book that you wrote letters to publishers to get your book published. And I told the wrong number. I said 323 times or something like that. But that really stuck with me. And I actually used that example that we'll talk about in a second um, with my students when they were writing um, in classes when I taught high school. And I thought that was such an important message about persistence and about what it takes to to get something done. And so you had told me that you had written letters to publishers, what was it, 147 times? 147 times, yeah. I mean, to get this book published, and it's, it's remarkable because it's been in print for 15 years, to get this book published was no easy task. Uh, I did make submissions, multiple submissions. Every major publisher you can think of in the, in the country, even publishers in Canada and the UK I submitted to. And the book got rejected 147 times. Now, you may mention earlier that you quoted a number that was in excess of 300. It felt like 147,000 times that I had rejected. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In terms of how it felt. But <laughs> I, had, I had a good fortune through all of those rejections of one day receiving a phone call from an editor at a major publishing house. And I just opened up the rejection letter from this publishing house. So I was really shocked that this editor was actually calling me. And she said that she wanted to tell me that she had four times recommended that her publishing house buy the book to publish it. And four times it had been declined and rejected. I just happened to receive the one rejection letter from those four declines. And that she, in 16 years, had not seen anything better written about this subject. And that she wanted to encourage me to continue seeking publication of it. And she wanted to give me some advice on how to do it. And so I immediately put the phone down and went and got a piece of paper and a pen because I wanted to come back on the phone and take editorial notes. I was willing to change the manuscript, do whatever I had to do to get it published. When I got back on the phone, the first thing she said to me was, don't change a word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that completely puzzled me. And she said, don't, because editors want to change everything, right? So she said, don't change a word. And uh, that puzzled me. And she said, the problem isn't what you wrote, per se. She said, it's who's reading it. That editors and publishers are not imported from an island of virtue. They come from the same America that you come from. They came from the same America that police officers and judges and doctors and teachers and everybody else in this country comes from. So they simply can't see what you wrote. It's, it's not that what you wrote is problematic. They just can't see it because their mindset is not shaped to see that. It's too obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need a box of crayons that are getting ready to go. They didn't want to deal with it directly. You're exactly yes. right. Yeah. yeah. So she said, so if you had written a book about a carrot patch, and from the north end of the carrot patch, a white bunny rabbit hopped in, and from the south end of the carrot patch, a black rabbit, bunny rabbit hopped in. So we're already dealing with stereotypes, north and south, right? They met in the middle, and they argue about who owned the carrot patch until they realized there was enough carrots for them the Sharon, it became French. She said they would publish that. Yep. And she said and that message <laughs> would go completely over the heads of any child that's being read to. Yeah. And she said, because there are like three million titles out there like that, and none of them work. Because if they worked, we wouldn't have this problem in the first place. Said, so what you wrote was totally different than what they're accustomed to seeing, and that's why it keeps getting rejected. So my advice to you is to go find an institution or organization whose mission statement reflects the intent of what you wrote and see if they'll do it. And I ended up doing that, and it ended up being published by Chicago Children's Museum. That's how it came to be. It was that very thoughtful and empathetic editor who called me up that day. You talk about the persistence of it all, because I've had many talks and speaking engagements when I talked about this story. And people will ask me, particularly aspiring writers, Jesus Christ, I'd have given up after two rejections. I don't know how you think Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. I mean, it's impressive. Rejections. <laughs> how did you do it? And, and my answer to that is twofold. When I was eight years old, I stuck away from home to try to make a Little League baseball team. My mother didn't want my brothers and I playing Little League baseball because she was afraid we were going to get hit in the head with the ball. And I snuck away, and I tried out, and I didn't make the team, and I was devastated. And I came back home, and I walked through the backyard, and my father was gardening in the backyard. And he saw my head down and walking like Charlie Brown and crying. <laughs> and I, I went into the basement and I sat into a dark corner and I just bawled my eyes out. Aww. And my father came into the basement and he saw me and he said, what are you crying about? 
And I said to him, I, I, I went to the park to try out for the Little League team, and I didn't make it. And he started to laugh, which I thought was cruel. Oh. In the moment. <laughs> right? <laughs> like a heckler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't need this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so he said to me, that's not why you're crying. And, and I'm thinking, okay, I was there. The ball went through my legs. I missed it. Coach told me to go home. I pretty much know exactly why I'm crying. Yeah. And he, he said, that's not why you're crying. He said, follow me. I have to go wash my hands. And I'll explain to you exactly why you're crying. So I follow him into the bathroom. He's washing his hands. He said, you're crying because you don't understand the law of averages. Okay, I'm eight years old. Like, <laughs> what does that yeah. mean? Okay. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. I do what you just said to me. <laughs> and so he said to me, this is what that means. He said, in life, there's an equal amount of yeses in the world as there are no's. That's the reason why we have to have, we have balance. One balances the other. He says, so for every yes out there, there's a no. For every no out there, there's a yes. Got that? I said, okay. I'm trying to follow him. He says, so the more no's you hear, the closer you are to a yes, because it has to balance off at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if you hear five no's, there are five yeses coming at some point in time, because it has to balance out. Okay, so I sort of understood what he was saying, but I really didn't get it. So I went to my mother with it. <laughs> and she's like, you stuck out of the house? Yeah, yeah exactly. The <laughs> yeah. First thing you tried out for what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if I was grounded in a moment, right? So he stuck out of the house, but she forgave me. She realized I was hurt and in pain. I was trying to understand this lesson my father gave me. She said, I'll make it a lot easier for you. She said, go get a piece of paper and a crayon. She said, I want you to write fail on one piece of paper, and I want you to write succeed on the other piece of paper. And I want you to put them on the table in front of me. So we're at the dining room table, put them on the table in front of me. So I want you to look at both of those. I said, okay. She says, anything you try to do in life, make a bed, learn how to tie your shoe, pass a test, you're gonna be dealt with one of these words. One of these words is gonna be a consequence. You're either gonna fail at it or you're gonna succeed at it. You got it? I said, yeah, that I understood. <laughs> and then she reached over, and balled up the piece of paper that said failure, gave it to me. She said, go put that in the garbage. You have no other option but this other. <laughs> She's like, it's not even an option, friend. It's not even an option. So you got to take failure completely off the table. It's not even an option. And that's where my persistence and perseverance grew from that moment on. I was eight years old. And so when I pursued this book, it wasn't just an issue of me as a writer trying to get a book contract to sell the book. This was an issue that came about because I was trying to resolve a very serious problem for my son. So I had a level of conviction about pursuing this book, not just an artistic endeavor. Yeah. as a commodity as an artist to get a book published. And anything you have a conviction about, you don't give up on. I had to succeed at it at some point. So that's, how I, that's why I had that persistence. The message is too important. Yeah, too important, exactly right. How did partnering with the Chicago Children's Museum, one, kind of benefit your community in any way? And then did they do anything beyond to sort of help get your message out there, you know, more than just reading the book? It, it came about, the whole connection came about. I knew a woman named Gigi Pritzker, who at the time, I think was a board chair for the Children's Museum. And I presented the manuscript to her. And I told her my story of woe about 147 rejections. And when she read the manuscript, it brought her to tears. Hmm. She said, this has to get published. We have to figure out some kind of way to do it. And I told her about an exhibit that I saw at the Children's Museum about race, but it was, the audience reach was much older. It was adolescent. And I said to her, the studies show that children are imprinted by racism and sexism by the time they're age two. Mm -hmm. So yep. we have to deal with this earlier. And the formative years of life are one to seven. The lessons we learn at age one to seven form the foundation of all our morals and principles for the rest of our life. Yeah. So I, I convinced her that we had to, to deal with this at an earlier age. And Chicago Children's Museum was a premier institution for early childhood development in the city. And this is a very compatible thing for the new. And she agreed. So that's how it got introduced to Chicago Children's Museum. I, I remember when we first had that meeting to talk about it, I knew some of the people in that meeting already, I didn't know one person there. It was a person that Gigi had brought into the meeting. It was a guy named Peter Solosi, who passed away, rest his soul. He was one of the most beautiful people I ever met in my entire life. And he was brought on as an art director for the book. 
because no one at the museum knew anything about publishing a book or what the book was supposed to look like or anything. And so this is what this meeting was about was how do you actually go about doing it? And Peter looked at me at one point and said, okay, do you have any idea for illustrators for the book? And I said, yeah, I read it all five names. And I said to him, but there's really only one person out there that really wants to do the book, only one. I don't know who this person is and I hope I can find him and I hope we can get him. I said, this guy named David Lee Sisko. And I said, I came to know who David Lee Sisko is in his art because at the time that I was pursuing this, there was a, a public art exhibit called Cows on Parade mm -hmm. in Chicago. We remember that one. <laughs> yeah, we remember. And we had that in Cincinnati too, only I think it was pigs. Pigs, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so the park that I took my son to, outside that park was a cow painted by David Lee Sisko. And the images on that cow were absolutely mesmerizing to me. And I knew that that was the artwork I wanted for this book. And I told that story to Peter and everybody else in the meeting. And right after I told that story, Peter said, really put up his hand to like halt the conversation. He said, hold on for just a second. And he pulled out his cell phone and everybody thought it was kind of odd, like he would interrupt the meeting right now because he's going to do a personal call. That was the phone. And somebody on the other end picks up and he goes, hey, David. And my eyes almost popped out of my head. <laughs> He said, hey, David, I know you always wanted to do a children's book. I said, I got just a project for you. I'll call you later and tell you about it. I hung up. Wow. And then he looked at me and said, you got him. <laughs> okay. Oh, my gosh. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> so it was like the, the skies had opened up and my blessings had been answered. And, and that, that's how the team developed between David and I, Children's Museum and Peter, in terms of getting this book done. There were early efforts to put a spotlight on it. Uh, we worked through local media to try to bring some attention to it. There were times and situations where I would come in and read the book to children and parent groups and we'd have discussions about it. So that was kind of how it was promoted through the community early on. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't imagine the book having any other illustrations. It's so stunning and it, and it fits Perfect. so well with yeah. the vision I feel like is coming from your words. And yeah, it's so beautiful. I, I totally agree with you on that. So since all of this has happened and, you know, 15 years have gone past since it was finally published and put out there into the world, how do you feel over the past 15 years uh, that it has been received by audiences all over? Have you seen an, a huge impact on readers, on children, on parents, or anything you'd like to share on that? That's a great question, and I have, because one of the things that has happened with respect to the book's reception is that it's been global. I hear from people in Scotland, I hear from people in Italy, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, people in like Morocco and so forth about what this book has meant to them, wow. and how it's allowed them to view this issue. The fact that it's been in print for 15 years also speaks to how it has resonated with audience, a reading audience out there continues to do so. The other aspect of its longevity happens to be one that I have great ambivalence about as we continue to have racial inflection points in this country and around the world, we're not the only country and society that has these issues. The book becomes a greater need and demand. So right now, the book is getting a lot of attention. You're right. I'm glad that it's there to serve this purpose, but I would hope we come to a point in time in this country and around the world, a book like this has popularity because people have an intention about character development of their children, rather than seeking a solution for why we have racial issues. Yeah, like mm -hmm. a Band-Aid. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hoping that we get to that point. But the book has been received very well. Its audience is only growing. It's only recently that uh, it's been restocked because it's been the, the hardcover supply for the book has been exhausted the last couple of months. Ever since the whole George Floyd incident took place, the book ran out of stock and it's so I just want to let everybody know it's back in stock. <laughs> yep. Get it while you can. And for the record, you yeah. need it. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Real quick follow-up on that. Uh, do you feel like that has had a huge impact on who you are as a writer since then? And maybe, you know, what part has that played in your professional journey? Uh, it has had a huge impact on me. For one, it has, I have to take this back to when I was 15 years old in order to really answer that question. When I was 15, I had this, thought that I was going to find the origins of discrimination. And by so finding it, I was going to bring a solution 
to discrimination in the world. One might ask how I came to that thought. I, it was at that age uh, I was introduced to the, to the word pathology. Okay, okay. And we look at cause and effect of disease and symptoms. And I took that understanding of that word and extrapolated it metaphorically. There's not only a pathology of the physiology of the body, but also the mind of the body and the psychology of the body, the spirituality and the emotion of the body. And so I began to look at things from a pathological point of view. And I looked at discrimination and hate as a disease of character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We can have diseases of the body. We can have diseases of character. And so I wanted to find a cure for that disease. And at age 15, I came to this understanding and this pursuit. And so I went to the library one day to begin my research and investigation on how I was going to find a cure for hate and discrimination. While I was going through this research, I came to an understanding also of why the words 15 and fool start with the same letter. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I've been off way more than I could chew, okay? I think the beauty in that story is that at 15, you bit off more than you could chew. That you weren't just sitting around, you know. It took me many years to finally swallow it. But I took off <laughs> a bit off more than what I could chew. And, and I didn't understand the anthropological scope of this or the genetic scope of this or anything. And so after several minutes of being frustrated of not knowing where to start, I sat down at a table at the library and I decided to do an exercise that my mother made my brothers and I do while we were growing up. The exercise was that we had to open up a magazine or a newspaper, close our eyes, and with a circle and trace the page and stop. And when we opened up our eyes, whatever word we stopped on, we had to start, start a story with. We had to write something. For oh, I like that idea. <laughs> it's a great exercise to do as an adult. And so there I was, frustrated, and I decided to do this exercise to kill some time. And there was a book on the table someone had left there. It was the first time I had ever seen a book like this in my entire life. It was a book of quotations. I didn't even know such a thing existed at age 15. Mm -hmm. But there it was. And so I opened up the book and I was turning the pages with my eyes closed and circling the pages. And when I finally landed on a page and I stopped, I opened my eyes and I landed on this very specific quote from the distinguished American educator named Horace Mann. And the quote said, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. And in that moment, instantly in that moment, I had my purpose for life yeah. in that wow. moment. Yeah, wow. Because what that quote said to me was, the life is so incredible. It is such an abundant gift that for you to live it selfishly, for only the purpose of self-gratification and to never live it for the greater good of humanity, then you should be ashamed of having lived at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that was very powerful for me when I read that. I interpreted it that way, and in that moment, I pledged to myself that my goal, the victory that I was going to seek, was to defeat hate. That was what I was going to do, and so there, therein lies the start of the answer to the question that you asked. That has shaped everything I've done with respect to writing. Everything I've done with respect to writing has been. How do I put something into the world to aid in that victory? Whether I'm writing about gender discrimination, uh, sexuality discrimination as it speaks to the LGBT community, or racism, or any kind of is All diseases of character, right? All diseases of character. Kamala Harris yeah. said the other day that in her speech that there's no vaccine for racism. And so you're talking about these diseases and there's not a vaccine for them, right? There, there isn't. I tend to look at it because it, as long as we have eyes, we're going to have racism because we're tribalistic creatures. But we can't have an inoculation to prevent us from getting sick. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. Okay? And to me, that inoculation is understanding what acceptance is because tolerance is, is sugar pills. It's not it. That's all <laughs> it's, a placebo. it's not working. And so yeah, we might not have a, a vaccination for the psyche that is a cure for the disease, but we can inoculate ourselves to gain a spiritual immunity from having been affected by the disease in the first place. And to me, that's how we can win this victory. We can have this victory to defeat hate is the messaging that we can put into the world and to our children. We're very lucky that you had that realization at 15 so that you 
you know, it led you to this book and to us having these tools for our next generation. As children get older, it can become more difficult to have those conversations. How did your message about these tough topics change as your children got older? Oh, that, that, that's, uh, that's like the $64,000 question. Right? <laughs> right? I know. <laughs> How do you build on it? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Because as you get older, the conversation becomes more problematic because it becomes more thematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. it becomes more of an issue of realizing what your child is going to have to encounter when he or she goes into the world. I had to think about what's the next step, what's the next message evolution for my sons, because I had this conversation with both of them uh, after the skin you live in. And that became, how do I get them to understand what they need to pursue as a construct of their own identity? And one of the ways that I presented that to them was to talk to them about the structure of a pyramid. Okay, a pyramid is based upon uh, the geometric figure of a triangle. It's the strongest architectural figure. You no, know, it's the reason why uh, those pyramids are still standing, right? And I try to explain to them that a pyramid is not constructed off, off of hewing a giant mountain into one shape. We're made from a composition of many blocks. We build block upon block upon until we get that entire structure. And we have the pointed capping stone at the top. And I say, you need to understand your identity that way. And the pyramid structure that you're trying to build for yourself as an identity is not what does it mean to be a man or a woman or an African-American or European-American or a Muslim or a Jew, is what does it mean to be human? Because each one of those modifiers that I just used, man, woman, Jew, Muslim, are blocks in the stone of someone's, uh, in the pyramid of someone's humanity. You know, six foot four is a stone that I'm married as a stone, that I'm a college graduate as a stone, that I'm a writer as a stone. But not one single one of those stones completely defines who I am. And that we have to think about the construction of your totality. Because if you don't, you will become vulnerable to being labeled and limited by the definition and distinction of one block. You will be reduced to one block. So all of my lessons going forward with my, my sons or about getting them to understand that they have to expand the notion of who they are beyond what they're being told who they are by society, beyond the labels and the terminology that they are told, and that they should never allow their humanity to be reduced to one thing. That's such a great message. And so all of my lessons were, were based upon that. I, I, I give you an example of how that's applied. Uh, there's a story that I have when I was uh, taking my son to school one day, my younger son at this point in time, um, and he was five years old, six years old, first grade, and the book was out. And many parents at the school had bought the book, which I was very happy about. Oh, wow. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Every morning I'd go to the playground, there's somebody putting a book in front of my face aside. It was great. And I'm standing there talking to one of the parents, uh, there, uh, the mother of, of the child who was in a class with my son, and she uh, was Italian-American ancestry. And she had just bought five books, which is great, because er earlier in the week, I signed all those copies for her. So here we are talking about the books. And her son runs up to us, and shortly behind him comes my son, because they, they sort of ran around together. And her son runs up to us, and he says, Mr. Tyler, Mr. Tyler. I said, yes. He said, what do you call yourself? Uh, I was puzzled. I said, you just call me Mr. Tyler. You can call me Mr. Tyler. <laughs> you want to call me by my first name? Give it a shot. He said, no, 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 no. That's not what I mean. So what do you call yourself? I said, I don't really understand what you're saying. And so his mother said to him, yeah, we don't understand what you're saying. And he says <laughs> to her great embarrassment, he said, mom and dad said that um, Sasha's parents are a salt and pepper couple. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Ziggy, I'm sorry, she's Ziggy's parents, because my youngest son's name is Ziggy. She says, Ziggy's parents are a salt and pepper couple. And so I looked at the mother, who had turned completely tomato red. <laughs> and you're like, um, let's buy one more book and... Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes, right? And so I said, oh, I understand what you're saying. And, and there's my son, Ziggy, standing behind him. Because I've had this conversation about salt and pepper couples and so on and so on. Yeah, more personification. Yeah, he didn't realize his, his friend was being introduced to this 
in much the same way that I told him we need to stop doing it. So I said to him, I said, let me ask you a question. He said, what? I said, your father's a lawyer, right? He said, yeah. I said, so has he ever talked to you about what it means to practice law and to go in courtrooms and that sort of thing? He said, yeah, all the time. I said, so maybe he's talked to you about a, a special type of court we have in this country called the Supreme Court. Hmm. And he said, yeah, my father's talked to me about Supreme Court. I know what the Supreme Court is. I said, it's like the ultimate court in the land. Whatever comes out of the Supreme Court is what we follow. God, he said, yeah. I said, okay. I said, in 1967, and I looked at his mother. I said, I want you to listen to this too. <laughs> listen up. Listen up. I said, in 1967, there was a case brought before the Supreme Court. It was a case of a white man and a black woman who were married. And they were married in the state of Virginia. And it was against the law for them to get married because they were of different races. I said, and laws at that time were called miscegenation laws. And there were miscegenation laws in the country that it was illegal for a black person and a white person to get married. And there was a young law student out there who felt that this was wrong and approached this couple to pursue it as a legal case. And I said, and they filed a lawsuit against the state of Virginia so that they could prove that it was okay for them to be married. And it made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. And Supreme Court agreed that it was unconstitutional, unlawful to bar them from being married simply because they were different races. And when the Supreme Court gave that judgment, it ended all the miscegenation laws of the country. And I looked at his mother and I looked at her son. I said, do you understand what I'm saying to you? And they nodded their head. I said, the reason why I bring you up that story is because the last name of the couple applies if you want to know what to call Ziggy's mother and father. I said, I'm going to spell it to you and I want you to tell me what that last name is. He said, okay. I said, it's L O V I N G. What do you call it? He said, loving. I said, that's what you call us. We're a loving couple. Oh my <laughs> gosh. And I looked at his mother. I said, that's what we are. Every now and then, Fate will present you with exactly that's as a mic drop. <laughs> they will present you exactly with the right thing to, to, to provide as a lesson to everyone. I said, so you can stop referring to us as salt and pepper. We're just a loving couple. That's all we are. This is how we actually need to talk to our children. We need to be informed so that we can give them those answers. Yeah, exactly. To explain to them the truth and make them feel like they're in it with you and they're learning and that you're curious about their thought process and help them be more curious and understanding. So I love what you said about when they ask, they're ready to listen. Yep, they're ready to listen. What parents need to also understand, what adults need to understand when it comes to the messages and instructions we give to our children, is that what we speak as truth and word must become truth and action. Okay, so what do I mean by that? It means nothing for you to tell your child that everyone is created equal if you do not include people who do not look like them in their lives. If you do not buy dolls from, that don't look like them for them to play with, to become friends with. If you take them out to public after telling them that everyone is born equal and everybody should be treated the same, but every time you see an African-American or a brown person, you're clutching your purse or you're acting with tension, or you're not making eye contact, or you're not speaking to them. Because the truth in action will always trump the truth in word. For example, we live in a country where in our constitution it says that all people are created equal by God, right? Endowed by God with certain inalienable rights. And we believe in religions and faith to say that God created everyone equally. Mm -hmm. But Sunday is the most segregated day of the week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the day of worship, it's the most segregated day of the week. So when we give those verbal messages to our children and we do not back up the truth of those verbal messages with our actions, then the action truth will become their reality because they will model that as their behavior. And that's how we then teach hypocrisy as a state of being. What do the people that you worship with look like? What do the people that in your neighborhood look like? What do the people um, at your school look like? Exactly. Who are you playing with? Mm -hmm. Who are you breaking bread with? Absolutely. Um, that's such a wonderful message. Is there any other parting wisdom about raising children that you'd like to include? We want to give you the opportunity 
and we could listen to you talk about it all day too. And I, and I probably could talk. All day. I know. Come over. <laughs> the parting message I would say is personal activism. Okay, we, we look at problems in society, we look at problems in the world, and we think that these problems are so huge that some organization or some body of people must come together and resolve these issues. And Rosa Parks was one person. Mm -hmm. Okay, Martin Luther King was one individual. Mahala was, was one individual. And all great revolutions and societal changes, uh, when I think about the young man who stood in front of the tank at Tiananmen Square, few years back. It was one person. They all begin with one individual. And so the greater problem that we deal with must be dealt with on a molecular level. Must the way that we deal with disease in the body, we must deal with it on a molecular level. And we all are molecules of society. That's the way I kind of look at it. And so it's our personal day-to-day -day interactions, the personal words that we speak, the personal conduct that we exhibit. That's the personal activism necessary to deal with this much larger problem out there. And so we have to teach our children to become personal activists. Mm. Yeah. How they enter that act in school. If they see a wrong being done, see a child being bullied or teased, step in. Yeah. Yep. If they think that there's something that the teacher isn't addressing, speak up. They can have these conversations with their own peers about this is how we should treat one another and this is how we need to play with one another empower them to be personal activists because it starts on that level and then it builds up into a greater movement. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Before we wrap up, I mean, first of all, it is such a pleasure to get to know you after all of these years and sit down and have a really meaningful conversation. And I'm so excited for our listeners to be able to hear all of your wonderful wisdom. I think just before we go, we'd love to know what you're reading right now or what's been inspiring you and then anything else that you're working on that you'd love for everyone to hear about as well. What I'm reading right now, the title escapes me, which I'm embarrassed about. It's a collection of essays by Toni Morrison. Is it The Source of Self-Regard, that one? There you go. That's it. We saw that book and we were obsessed with it and we were rushed out of this bookstore and we didn't get to purchase it. I highly recommend this book. Uh, Toni Morrison, one of the most brilliant writers mm -hmm. ever walked the mm -hmm. planet. And so, and, and reading that book, I'm also reviewing a lot of her earlier fiction works because her writing style and thought process about writing influenced me heavily. I've also, again, something that I do every year is the, the book that most influenced me as a child is A Little Prince mm -hmm. yeah. by Antoine Bassani Zuccaray. And so I just recently reread that again. I read it every single year. It continues to reinforce me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm working on eight other children's books that I'm trying to bring to publication and uh, another two that I just started to work on. But I'm also trying to bring to publication my first work of adult fiction, a novel. And I... And there's a little story behind this novel. I wrote it because my wife, uh, for, for four and a half years, resisted even saying hello to me. This is the biggest courtship you've ever heard of. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, talk to the hand. Exactly, <laughs> literally. And, and I fell in love with her at first sight. And I knew this is the only woman I really ever wanted to be with. Because I couldn't get her to talk to me or give me the time of day, I decided, she knew I was a writer, I decided to write a book because this was in the 1950s and I didn't have a guitar to go stand outside the window and serenade her. So mm -hmm. I, <laughs> you hear me talking. So I sound like a German shepherd howling when I sing. <laughs> so I decided to write a book. And in the book, I was going to put down every component and element and aspect of love that I wanted to convey to her that I was capable of. Oh my goodness. Because she kept rejecting me for four years and, and she should know that I withstood 10 years of rejection by publishers, so four years was yeah, nothing. Yeah, you got and that. So, <laughs> so, so because you kept rejecting me, I wrote enough material to, to like write a trilogy. And so <laughs> finally, when she gave me the time of day, I gave her the manuscript and she finally read it. Some light reading. Oh. <laughs> and so she instantly fell in love with the book. And I was able to sit down and have a conversation with her about her and explain to her why I wrote the book and go page by page what my intention was for that. And then the rest was history. I had her. <laughs> so How could you not? Book, 
That's, that's the book that I'm, it's called Take My Hand. That's the book that I'm trying to bring to publication. With. Take my hand. I can't with you. We're just so excited for you and to watch all of the things that you do and publish and share. And we just love it so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing your love and your story. And um, it was amazing chatting with you today. Thank you. It's amazing chatting with you. Hopefully we'll do it again. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, forever friends for sure. Absolutely. Forever friends. We'll 15 years already. <laughs> absolutely. Here you go. It's like an anniversary of sorts. Well, thanks a lot for having me on and allowing me this opportunity to give the book some exposure and explain a few things. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Take it easy now. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Health It's Personal. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts for bonus episodes and new releases every Wednesday. The Health It's Personal podcast is produced by me, McKenna Udi, and hosted with the Phronesis Health Initiative team, Karen Jively and Sean Tingle. Special thanks to portrait artist Alexander, musical contributor Bernie Ramke, and to our guests and experts for their kindness and bravery in sharing their stories each week. Please listen, subscribe, engage, and send us topics we can explore that would help you on your journey. Because health, it's personal.